Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dwight Fish, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of this congregation. Welcome to you all. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart is a welcoming community encouraging religious freedom, nurturing individual spiritual and ethical growth, celebrating diversity, and promoting a just and sustainable world. If you would like to learn more about this fellowship, please look at our website at uufe.org and join us after the service for our coffee hour in the gathering space. I brought sweet treats. <laughs> for the listening enjoyment of all, we ask that at this time that you please turn off your cell phones and pagers. Also, if you need uh, hearing support, we have uh, that help at our sound desk. Thank you for being here and celebrating life with us.
you can be confirmed at the annual meeting. And there's also financial assistance available. And for everyone who has news to share with the congregation, the focus deadline is tomorrow. So uh, my, inf my uh, contact your information is in the directory, or you can just uh, email Mike. So, uh, but we want to get everything in, all the news that's fit to print for UUFD. Last week's offering brought us $77 to share with the Elkhart Women's Shelter. This week's collection will be shared with the Elkhart County Jail Chaplaincy. Thank you very much. Yes, Ken. Um, don't forget, this Tuesday at 2 o'clock is the last um, session of Science and Society for the month of April. So, okay. 2 o'clock in the gathering place. Thank you, Ken. So. We ring the gong three times. Once for those who came before us and made a place for us. Once for those who are here now. And once for those who will come after us and build on the dream. is by Rumi. <clears throat> in this earth, in this immaculate field, we shall not plant any seeds except for compassion, except for love. Now we'll recite our uh, covenant in unison. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. We'll now sing hymn number six.
for other humans, and it's a beautiful, beautiful gesture. And I think Rita's story will open a lot of ideas and thoughts about it. So I uh, ask that Rita come join us at the front and uh, share her story. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I um, uh, I just want to tell you I am um, just like you. I'm ordinary, um, and uh, there's nothing. There might I might be unique, but I'm not special. So it's something that just just know that you and I are just alike. The only thing that's odd about me this morning is um, I am a normal person. I like to tell you that because. I don't always carry around an 18 by 12 photo of my children, um, <clears throat> but I'd like to let you know who I'm talking about. And these are my girls. Melissa's the oldest, and Teresa is the youngest in this photo. And this so captures two of them. This was just three weeks before Melissa, my oldest, passing. And it's uncanny. She doesn't look sick at all, does she? It's just amazing. But the fun part was she was absolutely annoyed because the photographer put her little sister on a box. So she was taller. And so she's very smug in this picture because she's taller. And her sister is annoyed, rolling her eyes like, oh, don't give her any power. <laughs> so they were ordinary children, too. And I'll just set that down if you don't mind. And it does go on the wall. I don't carry it everywhere. But <clears throat> what I wanted to share with you is I'd like to take you to a time where it was a beautiful day like this. We're coming up on an anniversary, the Memorial Day of when this all happened. And we had just 10 days left in third grade. And there couldn't have been two sisters that loved each other more. And <clears throat> so I got everybody ready. We got the car, got her school, dropped her off. Her little sister yelled something out the window and uh, to annoy her sister. Her sister again rolled her eyes. <laughs> and off to school she went. A few hours later, I got a call saying that she had fallen and to come to the school. So I dropped my youngest off at a friend's house and made a beeline. The school was just a few short blocks away. When I arrived, she was on the ground and she had ambulance and EMTs, which I knew many of them, and they were helping her. We rushed her over to uh, the, our local regional hospital, and it was obvious that she was in very uh, dire circumstances, having seizures and so forth. So then we went on to a regional hospital, a much larger hospital in Fort Wayne. And through the tests and through the day, um, it's, it's absolute, uh, epilepsy, it's this, it's that, we didn't have any answers. About 4 o'clock the next morning, the surgeon came back and said, she's had a massive stroke. She was only 10 years old. What are you talking about? And it's something that I never would have believed in a million years, but she was a living, breathing miracle. She had a coarctation of the aorta, which when your aorta comes off the top of your heart, that was so narrow they couldn't get a wire catheter through when they tried to do the test. That little girl was a gymnast. She was always tumbling, flipping, turning, and whatever you could do. That was my Melissa. And it, she would never in a million years have believed she was ill and as sick as she was. <coughs> to give you an idea, um, one in a hundred thousand adults suffer from this condition. One in a billion children have the same problem. So who would ever guess? Who would ever guess? Through the next few days, um, th 
things went up and down, as with stroke victims, she was paralyzed. But let me tell you, when they came in to do things to her, her eyes said everything. There was no doubt about she was in there. She couldn't speak, but when she saw her little sister, her eyes just lit up like a Christmas tree. So our Melissa was there. Dwight, God love him, was right by my side through the whole thing. And he was my liaison. My focus was on my daughter. And he helped communicate that information to others. Because everybody wanted to know. Everybody needed to know. So he was my go-to person. <coughs> he suffered some abuse at the hands of myself, I'll tell you. But that's okay. He did what he needed, and he did what I needed. It was so compassionate, so kind. I've been forever grateful. As the week progressed, the tests and tests and blood and so forth, and she was not doing very well. And late that week, later that week, on Friday night, they said, you, you might want to stay close by. Well, I never left. But they said, you might want to stay in the parents' family room. Why they call them quiet rooms? I don't know why they're not quiet to me. I bawled like a baby, and I probably scared the other people. But it's something that I, I understood them to mean that she was not doing well. Most of us are in a cranial pressure is about zero to one. When I speak, it's probably four or five because I get a little anxious. But hers went from the teens to the 20s to the 40s, 60s. It peaked at, at 3 o'clock in the morning at 121. There was no doubt that I had lost my girl. So what do you do? I listened. We did test after test. There's no doubt in my mind, I can assure you having been through that, that the, the declaration of brain death in Indiana is, is not a good thing, but it's a thing that is, um, there's no ambiguity. Are they gone? Are they not? There are separate teams that come in. Your doctor doesn't do that exam. Other teams of doctors come in and do those exams. There are amazing people that do this for a living. And uh, the thing I'd like you to know is that grace led me to this choice. My husband and I went down to the cafeteria and I looked at him. And I said, if something happens, I, I, I think we should choose organ donation. We had never talked about it, never been part of our family. We didn't know anyone. And he and I talked for a little bit, and he agreed. So I went back to the, one of the nurses, and I just said, if something happens, I want her to be an organ donor. And bless her heart, that poor nurse said, uh, uh, no. <clears throat> and I knew it wouldn't happen if I left it there. Again, by grace, I went to another nurse and I said, if something happens, we want her to be an organ donor. And I, what I didn't know is, that just doesn't happen. But again, grace led me there. And so, through uh, communication, through the different methods of telling the right people, uh, that's what our family chose. So by 9 o'clock the next morning, everything had been done. We knew she was gone. We said our goodbyes. And then you have to take a step. And you just, you can take a small step forward, but you still, you take a step. And I know that Grace left me a big pillow to fall on because I needed it. Um, my girls meant and still do mean the world to me. What happens at that point is IOPO, which is the Indian Organ Procurement Organization, 
they're notified, and UNOS, which is a united network for organ sharing, is notified. And <clears throat> what they do is UNOS keeps the master list. They have everybody in the country who needs an organ. And I'll tell you, as we sit here today, 17 more people will die waiting for any type of organ that will save their life. Do you have to do it? No. But you should know what the options are. Even if you have cancer, you can donate your corneas. There's no blood flow to the eyeball itself. The cornea itself, I should say not the eyeball, but the cornea doesn't have any blood flow. So even as a cancer patient, I could donate my corneas. Someone else can see. And I told Dwight earlier about a gentleman in Washington, D.C. He was a police officer. And he met me. And he said, you're not my donor family. But he grabbed me by the arms. He said, I have to tell you thank you. He was a police officer, went blind in one eye. A couple weeks later, he went blind in the other. He was going to kill himself. He had no career. He had no life. He had no nothing. He didn't feel like he could go on being blind. And he had no idea what he could do without sight. And he said he got a corneal transplant. And so he had to make sure that he said, your, said a thank you to someone who had donated. And I can tell you that that is, there's nothing good about losing a family member. And certainly the hole that was left in my heart by losing my daughter, I can't even begin to describe. But what I can tell you is that organ donation was so comforting. After that declaration of death is declared, and you're an organ or tissue donor, your family is appointed an advocate by IOPO. And that advocate stays with your family member through all of the donation process. They are there through every step of the way to make sure your wishes are honored and to make sure that the wishes you do not want are honored. So nothing happens that you haven't said you wanted. Um, I always jokingly say, you know, we can have a real serious sit down conversation and talk about, <clears throat> pardon me, we can talk about it in depth and what our wishes are and so forth. Or you can say, I'm getting a haircut tomorrow. If something goes wrong, you never know. I just want you to know I've signed my donor card. You can be that short about it. But the reason I am kind of jokingly about it is if you choose donation, 92% of your family members will do exactly what you want. If you never tell someone, that drops to 40%. And that's amazing to me because just by telling someone, and it, it's just phenomenal, phenomenal what they can do with organ and tissue donation. It's not only save lives, but to improve and help lives. Melissa was 10 and she donated organs and tissues. She saved nine individuals. One was a double transplant. About a week after her passing, I got a letter. I should say we, our family, got a letter. And oh, it's bent ear to dog. It's dog-eared and bent, and it's, it's a mess. <coughs> but I used it not only for the beauty in it, but to also make myself sad when I needed to. Sometimes when you need a good cry, you sit down, you read that letter, and you realize that's a life that you gave life to. And what an amazing gift it is. And what an amazing gift those people beyond. And if I cry, then it doesn't sneak up on me in the middle of the grocery store. I'm bawling and the lady just thinks I read the National Enquirer story. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things that sometimes when you make yourself cry, it helps you not to cry when you least expect it. I wouldn't last two seconds up here to tell you what it was like to put her things away. 
to tell the dog, if you bring one more thing to me of hers, I will kill you. <laughs> and I'm a peaceful person. But he didn't understand, and I didn't either. <laughs> um, I opened the freezer, and there was a head of lettuce. I don't remember putting it there, but my husband was not a grocery shopper. He didn't put it there. Teresa was little. She didn't put it there. I had to have put the lettuce in the grocery, in the groceries away, and put the lettuce in the freezer. I sat down on that floor and I laughed so hard until I did cry. Because you can't do a thing with frozen lettuce. <laughs> you can't make soup, you can't do anything. So you have to love and forgive yourself. But that letter was so full of pain and sorrow. But as your hymnal just said, you say yes to life. <clears throat> Melissa donated her organs through our decision. But I can tell you that little sweetheart would have done the same thing. We were playing a game and how kids do, and we turned a chair around backwards and a big game of bank teller. And she said, Mommy, write me a check. And I said, Oh, you okay. And I made it off for a million dollars and I wrote it with my name on it. And she very sternly handed it back to me and said, You're not playing by the rules. And I said, well, What are the rules? And she said, This is the children's needy fund. You put your name on it. Well, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean that. That's just who she was. Was she perfect? No. I will never forget her taking her beloved Barbie dolls and shaking it in Teresa's face, asking her why she chewed on her feet. <laughs> and she met it with every fiber of her being. And so she was a very, very, very wonderful, loving person. <clears throat> her liver went to a woman who was a code three, which meant she was going to die in 48 hours if she hadn't gotten a transplant. That woman was in her 60s. She was able to see her grandchildren be born. Melissa's two kidneys went to two different people. One was a gentleman in southern Indiana, the other woman was uh, the, the woman was in her mid-30s, and God bless her. One day she's diabetic, the next day she's not, due to that transplant. She became well enough. She had her own family, her own children. And I just think that's so amazing. And Melissa's heart valves, Melissa's heart, was too small for the young man who was 16 in Indianapolis, who I think of on occasion. He didn't get her heart, not because it wasn't his time, it's just she was a very tiny, petite little girl. And so um, her valves were sent to Loma Linda, California, and used for infants for um, valve replacement. So there are a number of children that have grown up because of her. And it's, her corneas went one to a man, one to a woman here in Indiana. And it just, it's amazing to think of how far reaching that, that gift can be. Um, to let you know, the um, Indian Orphan Procurement will, uh, you don't know the names, I've never met anybody, I don't need to. My theory on organ donation is it's a gift, it may be an ultimate gift. But you don't owe me anything. You don't need to do anything. Do the best your life can be. And as a gift, Melissa doesn't live within anybody. They live on this earth because she was part of it. And I think that if I can, you know, when we give a gift, we're supposed to give that gift. There are no strings attached. And I really do believe that in this case. There are no strings attached. Um, it's a pretty phenomenal thing to do. And I have been all over the U.S. 
I was uh, honored by being chosen to go to the White House uh, a number of years ago and I met Barbara Bush and I did not know it but their daughter Robin had died of leukemia and was an organ donor, a corneal donor, I'm sorry, corneal donor. And I sat with Barbara Bush at this reception and you want to talk about surreal, I'm a normal every day, you know, yesterday I wore sweats all around their house. I had nothing better to put on. <coughs> but Barbara Bush and I sat there, just two moms telling kids stories, and she was just like me. And it was so profound, but yet so ordinary. And, and I just want to tell you that if you at all consider it, the next time you do your driver's license or your ID, you can say, yes, I want to be an organ donor. You can go on IOPO, it's IOPO.org, or you can go to UNOS. You can sign and make your wishes known. You don't have to do it just because I came to visit with you. But if you want that, make sure your family knows. Um, the, the things that I think are special is, you know, uh, people who are in the burn units, if I donate um, my, my skin, and it's difficult to talk about things, but if I donate that, you will never know. I can have an open casket. Nobody will ever, ever know because I got plenty to give. <laughs> And they take that skin and it's so precious and it lasts six times longer than any man-made substance. So those beautiful, poor, burn patients don't have to go through that Burma process so often because human skin is like nothing else. And because it's so rare in receiving it, they stretch it and they do all kinds of things to it to make it so more people can use it. I have no problem sharing that. God bless them, they can have all the <laughs> cellulite and dimples they want. <laughs> but I think that it's just something that we should think about. There's no greater thing than compassion for another human being. And I think if I can share that one thing is, losing Melissa was, was incomprehensible. But what I can tell you is, by grace, her organ donation is what helped me get through it. And in closing, I'll just share with you, um, her sister Teresa uh, is a grown woman now. And in just a few weeks, we'll be getting married. But uh, about 10 years ago, she became a match for a stem cell recipient. And it was in a Scandinavian country, so we all kind of went, how did you get over there in your past life, whatever you may have been? We found out her great-grandfather had some Swedish background. The point is, she matched a young man, and she went through the stem cell donation process and became our family's first stem cell donor. So I couldn't have two more amazing girls in my universe ever. The young man lived for another year, had another Christmas, had another birthday. He turned 18 before he passed. He didn't die because he didn't get a donation of secondary uh, problems. And what did they do? <coughs> they asked her to do it again because she was such a perfect match for him. And she did. And let me tell you, it wasn't a comfortable process for her. And she did it the second time and gave him an extended life with his family. He has since passed away. But what a glorious thing to do is to give someone that time when they don't have time. So if I can encourage you, you are more than welcome to ask me anything. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. I appreciate it if you let me talk about my girls. Thank you. <coughs> so I'll uh, just walk down through here. I've, I've donated my body to the Anatomical Society. Um,
but can I also be an organ donor doing that? Do you know? Do you have any experience that I haven't contacted them? Or um, you would still want to sign your donation card because what they will do to give you an idea, if you're an organ donor, you have to be on life support, and you're not alive. You are. You have passed. But to be an organ donor, blood has to be flowing through your body. She was still hooked up. Her, you know, they were. Her chest was still rising, and so forth. But she was no longer alive. Her brain was gone. So organ donation is kind of separate. But you can certainly donate other things, like corneas. If you if you choose to do both, you certainly can. There is no cost to the family. That's another thing that's very important. I have um, a frame around um, my license plate that says, recycle yourself. Oh, I love that. <laughs> that's great. I got it at the University of Michigan Hospital where my stepson and Phil's son was a double double transplant recipient. Oh, neat. Um, that was 15 years ago. Um, the morning we found out about it, it was, I was, you know, bouncing off the ceiling for, for days. Um, and uh, Tony was, there's some kind of process they were able to go through in Michigan where both parties agree. And he was in touch with that family of that 12-year-old boy. Until Tony died this past winter, but that pancreas lasted 14 freaking years, and they don't do that. But we had that time. With That's Tony. wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. And let me tell you, from the donor side of the family, you are as important to me as I am to you, because there's nothing good about losing that precious, beautiful girl. But her donation made all the difference to my survival. And I had a four-year-old, and I told Oksana this morning, she was going like this on my forehead, and I opened my eyes, and I thought, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, and she said, I'm hungry. Oh, okay, I have to go on. And so I credit my daughter for saving my life, but I'll tell you, organ donation was such a comfort to me. Rita, tell us, um, we're coming up on that anniversary, and boy, you're bringing back a lot of memories for me, but how long has it been? Actually, she died um, May 29, 1990, and so it's been a while, but I'll tell you, the story is timeless. It could be yesterday, it could be 30 years ago, but I'll tell you, it's, it's no less of a blessing now as it was then because lives have gone on we don't know what the lives of the people she saved what they've done they could be amazing other questions rita thank you very much you. you are relieved of duty <laughs> can i sleep inside the house tonight yes <laughs>
ready to close out our service today. Lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace to you all. Thank you, Rita.